morning. Good to see you all. Uh, this morning we're going to look at a little passage in the middle of Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. I've entitled the sermon, uh, The Law is Not of Faith, which is um, a phrase taken from that passage. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think that what... What I'm going to talk about this morning, at least as I understand it, is like the heart of what we believe. I mean, it is the heart of the Christian faith. If, if you could find little passages in the Bible that are addressing the issue, if somebody said, well, so what do you guys believe? What does it mean to be a Christian? This, this is it. I mean, this is, um, I think, what the Apostle Paul is hammering out virtually in every little epistle and big epistle, Romans included, and First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, that he writes. So we're looking at Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. Hear now the word of God. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith. But the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. As far as the reading of God's Word, let us pray. <clears throat> Father in Heaven, there is so much talk this, these days about what it means for a church to have the promise of the Spirit through faith. And we pray, Father, that our church would have that. And that we would understand, Father, this morning, uh, this central message written by the Apostle Paul, but certainly, Father, inspired by your very Holy Spirit, that we might know, Father, glorious things that are comforting to the soul. So, Father, we do pray that you would give us instructable hearts and clarity of thought. pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I um, occasionally receive magazines from former seminaries that I've attended. I've attended a few different seminaries of various different theological persuasions. And I recall getting one and it had a cover story that asked the question, how do you get close to God? How does a person get close to God, getting closer to God? Three of the professors at this uh, seminary were interviewed and their answers ranged from things like a more vital prayer life to becoming uh, a better listener to God. Uh, whatever that whatever that might be, uh, to looking for opportunities to serve. So there's a list of things offered to the people to help them get closer to God. None of the things were necessarily bad things, but in my opinion, as I read the story, something was missing. What Paul writes about in this portion of the Christian faith of his epistle, I think, is the heart of the message. I think it is his theme for all of his epistles. I have found that this message, and not only for me, but for those that I've been able to convey to this message, is quite frankly a, an oasis for the heart, soul of sinful men. I think this message, message addresses the people who recognize that they're simply incapable of getting close to God. That this effort that we make to get close to God seems to be of no avail. The message here is the message that grants peace to the souls of people who have realized there, there seems to be nothing about me that gets any closer to God with all of my effort. Paul writes in verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. I remember as a kid uh, watching Looney Tunes. Do you remember Looney Tunes? I don't think they've shown them anymore. Maybe you can find them somewhere. Um, Looney Tunes, uh, they didn't seem to have boundaries. Uh, at least they were not well-hidden boundaries. And I remember cartoons clearly expressing the idea 
that if you are good, you go to heaven, and if you're bad, you go to hell. And I remember a car- watching a cartoon as like a seven-year-old where somebody, I forget who it was, you know, Bugs Bunny or Yosemite Sam or somebody, well, was in hell with flames and devils. And, and I mean, I'm thinking, looking back, going, what an intense thing, you know, for children's view. You're good, you go to heaven. You're bad, you go to hell. I have found that that theme is pretty consistently sold, not only in our culture, but in every culture that I'm aware of. If you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. We've, 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 uh, we've seen this in media. I remember a movie came out years ago called Defending Your Life. It was kind of a funny movie, fun movie. But the idea is you need to stand before some council and justify yourself that you were good enough. Or ghost. Remember ghost? You know, what's the catch of lazy and all that. The idea, I don't know if you remember, but in the movie, the, the, you know, the good guy becomes kind of an apparition and, you know, seems pretty happy. The bad guy, remember what happens to the bad guy? You know, these dark things come and grab him and drag him into hell because he's the bad guy. And the good guy gets to become the apparition and the new one. So, what you, what you virtually never see is anything that actually resembles genuine Christian redemption. Good equals heaven. Bad equals hell is, quite frankly, what the Apostle Paul is warring against in the passages before us. The phrase, I think, that should jump out at at us here is, all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You, you need to do all the things, all the things, not some of the things. You need to do all of the things that are written in the book of the law. <coughs> in other words, if you're going to approach God, if it's your plan to approach God with the good equals heaven, bad equals hell method, you must keep Every last commandment. Now, you might say to yourself, well, I haven't broken the Ten Commandments, so let me explain to you that the Ten Commandments are a summary. Okay, those are, I mean, you might go, I've never killed anybody, I've never done this, or anything like that. But it's a summary of all the commandments in the Scripture. In other words, you need, or I would need, moral perfection in every thought, in every word, and in every deed, from the point of conception till the day I die. Now, if you think you've done that, then just turn your iPod on and listen to, you know, something else right now, because the rest of the message isn't going to make any sense to you. But I would like to add, before you turn your iPod on and tune me out, that the Bible does indicate that if we say we have no sin, that we are a liar and the truth is not in us. So I guess I'm indirectly saying you're lying to yourself. If you don't think you've done that, you violated it. As we have the standard is absolute moral perfection. <clears throat> Basically, what Paul is doing is, is he's creating an empty set. Right? He's saying, yeah, if you're good enough, if you're good enough, you go to heaven. But what he's going to explain, and what the Bible explains all over the place, is there's nobody in that category. But that no one, he goes on to say, is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Justification. He uses the word justified here. I think we need to understand what that means in order for this passage to make sense. What does it mean to be justified? The word justified is a very legal word. It's a very forensic word. It's the idea of a declaration of acquittal. Think of the gavel going down, acquitted. The Apostle Paul in Romans 8 kind of paints the picture of a courtroom. With the, with the words, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Okay, who's, gonna, who's bringing the charge against God's elect? And then he goes on to say, because it is God who justifies. In other words, it's God who equips. So who dare would bring a charge against God's elect? Kind of one of those, who do you think you are? Moments we see in Scripture. The gavel goes down, <clears throat> and God the judge grants us freedom from the due punishment. That's what it means to be justified. Justification. Let me explain this. I think, you know, I, even though I think this is a simple message, it's a, it's a message that explains the heart of the Christian faith. Quite frankly, for a child, 
I realize there are terms here that make it a little bit, I don't want it to sound like a seminary class, but I think there's terms we need to understand. Justification, acquittal, has nothing to do with how you feel. It has nothing to do with your disposition. It has nothing, it has nothing to do with anything that's going on in here. Okay, justification is something that happens outside of you. Again, think about the courtroom, right? You're sitting there, quite frankly, guilty of sin. And, the, and there's a decision being made by the judge. And quite frankly, if we're going to look at it the way the Bible looks at it, between the judge and your lawyer, your advocate, there's dialogue going on. And you're just sitting there. You know, in courtroom, I, I still will I'll occasionally watch, you know, Perry Mason, because, you know, it's clean. So you have to go back like 50 years, you know. So you, you, but yeah, the, the scene where the judge gets the note from the jury, right? And he opens it. And you're trying to get a, a read on, is he guilty or is it? That's not changing who you are at all, is it? That's a decision being made outside of you. Justification is basically something that it happens between the negotiations between the father and the son. Now, I may hasten to add, uh, add to this that it has a dramatic effect upon where you will spend eternity. So you're sitting there, you're waiting for the judgment, and you realize who I am, how I feel, my emotions, my husband. But what, I, what I'm about to hear is going to affect me forever. All right? You got the courtroom little paradigm down there. When you're on trial, sitting at the defendant's table, the judge reads the verdict. The declaration of acquittal is something happening outside of you. Paul here then quotes Habakkuk 2.4, telling us that the just shall live by faith. This concept, the just shall live by faith, is um, really op- quite opposite to our normal experience. It, it is the common experience, and this is why I think the concept is hard for people to get. It's the common experience of, of man for the behavior to dictate the calling. Let me explain. Uh, I'm a homeowner. I have built uh, two big fences and three decks at my home. Uh, no journeyman carpenter will go to my house, look at what I've done, and declare me to be a carpenter. <laughs> uh, the untrained eye may, you know, go, hey, you did a good job here. But people who are actually in the business will kind of go, oh, you did this yourself, didn't you? My, my behavior would need to excel still more in order for me to be granted that title. And we see that with doctors, with artists, with mechanics, and what have you. But friends, in God's economy, that matter is turned around, if if you will. He declares the man to be a carpenter by grace and then inclines his heart toward his tools and then toward his labor. Like he's saying, you're a carpenter. Now pick up your tools. I'm not going to make you the excellent at this. I'm going to say you are a carpenter and now it's time to pick up your tools and go to work. God grants us faith, calls us His child, justifies us by grace. He, he puts His name on us. You belong to me. By faith. It is after this that we, like Isaiah, say, Here I am. Send me. Now, now I'm ready to go to work. Keep in mind the Ten Commandments, right? How do they begin? We always, you know, I mean, we think the Ten Commandments, we think, uh, you know, have no other gods. But that's not really how it begins, right? There's a little purpose there. What's the purpose? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. In other words, I have delivered you. Now do my work. That's the order we see in the Ten Commandments. The just shall live by faith. means that faith in Christ Faith in Christ precedes, and I would argue, accompanies all human action. In other words, whether I'm an unbeliever who's coming to faith in Christ for the first time, 
or a believer who's seeking to do good works. It all must be done in faith. I'm doing this as somebody who's been granted faith. So, so I, I'm, I'm saying this because what does it mean to just shall live by faith? What does shall live mean? Does it mean coming to life? Is it like Lazarus in the tomb? He shall live. He's dead. He shall live. Or does it mean governing your life? You know, how shall you live? I, well, I shall live by Gandhi, or I shall live by Jesus, or I shall live by Confucius. I mean, what, which does it mean? We, this morning, at the early service, we had a new member, Dora Orozco, and we asked the questions, right? The four questions we asked new members. Shall live, I think, can address question number two and number three. Question number two is, do you believe in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior? In other words, did He give you life? Yes. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord? Shall you govern your life with Jesus as Lord? Yes. I think there's a false dichotomy that people make here. I think we need to make a distinction. The just shall live by faith. Faith in Christ to justify us. And faith in Christ in terms of our life, our sanctification. But it, to people, I think, wrongly remove one of those things with what, you, what logicians call a false dichotomy. Anyway, I digress a little bit. I had a footnote there, and I my notes and I had to address it. Seeking friends to obey the commandments apart from faith, apart from the gracious deliverance, is an exercise in vanity. I, I know uh, that, you know, we have visitors Sunday in our, you know, visit our church on Sunday, and maybe, you know, you're seeking religion or you're looking for religion, and let me just tell you, you don't get anything, and I need to get my act together, you know, I'm not right with God, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. If you're seeking to have peace with God as a result of your ability to live up to a certain standard, you've lost before you start. The Apostle Paul contrasts this idea with the law. Yet the law is not a faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Those who lean on the law, and by that I mean, you know, kind of say, I'm going to be good in order to go to heaven, those who lean on the law for their justification before God, you know who they're leaning on? They're leaning on themselves. Those who lean on faith for their justification before God, if you will, lean on Christ. In the law, it is the man who does them, but in faith, it is Christ who does them. That is, the good works. This is, I think, an interesting quotation Paul uses from Leviticus 18, some, I believe, mistakenly understand this text to say that men ought not to make every effort to obey the law of God as if faith and works were enemies. I was listening to uh, Mick do the prayer, or Elder Mick up here praying, and I'm listening to his prayer and thinking, his prayer is addressing exactly what I'm talking about. Of course, he did that prayer in about three minutes, and this is going to take me 40 minutes, but I'm listening to what he's saying, and I'm thinking people need to understand what that prayer means. I mean, I think he made it really clear. But that's what this is all about. The relationship with works and law. It, are, are works an enemy of faith? It's a trick question. Are works an enemy of faith? Because the answer is a definitive yes and no. Right? In, the, in the category of justification, there are enemies. But in the category of sanctification, in other words, how I govern my life, they, they both must be there. Faith and works are only enemies in the context of justification. I, I, if I were to put my notes here like in size 28 font, that would be it right there. Faith and works are only enemies in the context of justification. What, what I'm saying is some people were justified by faith, so you got to get the law out of here. Law is Old Testament. That's old school. you got to get in that New Testament. You might, you know, you're all Presbyterian. Well, most of you are Presbyterians here, so you're going, well, you know, Pastor Paul, you're the preacher in the choir, or you're creating a caricature. Let me tell you something. Because I, I, I rub elbows with people outside of my own denomination. If we were to get all the Christians in America, and I don't know for sure this, and in one big room and say, hey, 
Should we seek to walk in the law of God? I'm gonna, I would argue that most of them would say no. Law is out. We're under grace. Christ, they quote, they quote, in my opinion, misquote Romans, Christ is the end of the law. And by that, they're, they're like going, law is gone. Law is out. I mean, I, it's patiently and gently as possible. I believe they're mistaken. I believe what they're doing is they're kind of throwing the baby out here with the proverbial bath water to suggest that faith and works are enemies is to really, quite frankly, suggest that God is ethically inconsistent. For God to say, I think this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is right, this is right. But now that you're a Christian, that doesn't matter anymore. Just figure it out for yourself. You're made in my image. Figure it out for yourself. John Calvin puts it this way. And I, I'm quoting Calvin twice here. I think twice or three times. Twice. Because people will use, you know, everybody... John Calvin is kind of like the uh, theological equivalent to Ben Franklin in politics. Everybody wants him on their side. Right? If you can quote Ben Franklin, you know, uh, I remember I was asked to do a prayer at some community thing, and I got up there and I said, well, you know what, in the words of Ben Franklin, and everybody was like, You know, but the people who are kind of astute theologically, Calvin, although a lot of people don't like Calvin, but Calvin is kind of like, it's just in reform circles. And people will use Calvin to argue against what I'm about to say here, or what I am saying here. But here, listen to this quote. <clears throat> Talking about the law is not a faith. The law evidently is not contrary to faith, otherwise God would be unlike himself. What an interesting quote. But we must return to a principle already noticed that Paul's language is modified by the precise or the present aspect of the case. In other words, what's the context here? The contradiction between the law and faith lies in the matter of justification. It's in that issue that they're enemies, if you will. You will more easily unite fire and water than reconcile these two statements that men are justified by faith and that they are justified by the law. The law is not of faith. That is, it has a method of justifying man which is wholly at variance with faith. Paul is not saying here, we're justified by faith, so do whatever you want, the law is out. <clears throat> what he's saying here is, the law is not of faith in terms of being justified before God. D.A. Carson also explains, Paul does not develop the ethical implications of faith, it is clear from other passages that he regarded an obedient life, that is, faithfulness, as inseparable from the faith that justifies. In other words, if you're justified by faith, you'll walk in faith. The Apostle is not using Habakkuk 2 4 for purposes that contradict the original. And finally, one last quote from Calvin. And yet it does not follow from this that faith is inactive or that it sets believers free from good works. For the present question is not whether believers ought to keep the law as far as they can, get this, which is beyond all doubt. In other words, everybody should know that. I can't tell you how many friends of mine are in the Reformed community who some don't seem to know that. Calvin says it's beyond all doubt that we should try to keep the law, that we should seek to walk in obedience. But, he continues, whether they can attain righteousness by works, which is impossible. Right, you get it? It's like me telling my kids, you know what, if you're good enough, I'll be your dad. No, you know what? I tell my kids, I am your dad. I love you. You're, uh, you really have nothing to do with your own birth. It was all me and mom. Okay? And we love you. But if they say, well, if that's the case, then I can just do whatever I want. And I don't know. We're going to have to deal with that little issue. Friends, there's a great difference between our seeking to live within the boundaries of God's law and receiving God's promise of salvation by faith. There's a world of difference there. It's the difference between faith and works. Law and gospel. You know the difference between the law and the gospel? It's the difference between the demand and the gift. And the difference between these two things is the difference between heaven and hell. We must make a distinction between law and gospel. Justification and sanctification. In the law, it is the man who does... In the gospel, it is Christ who does. 
You understand? The law is what God demands. The gospel is what God provides. The law, the stuff, you know, when we're looking at the law, it's like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? When we look at the gospel, it's what, is, what has God done? Now Paul is going to explain <clears throat> how God maintains the purity of his righteous and just character while at the same time forgiving sinners. Now, you, you, this, this may be no big deal to you, what I just said. God's going to maintain his just character while at the same time forgiving you and me. I, I can't tell you what a unique proposition that is. Because we tend to think of God forgiving people kind of the way we do. Oh, you know, hey, uh, Dad, I broke your cup. And I'm like, oh, that's okay. Or you, somebody bumps into you and you're like, oh, I'm sorry. And they say, I'm sorry. And you're like, oh, that's okay. No big deal. Well, it doesn't work that way. It's not like God's going, you know, I know you're a sinner. I know what you're doing is worthy of death and the curse should be on you. But I'm just going to... That's just not the way it works. Listen, I mean, he uses very dramatic terms here. He appeals to a passage in the Old Testament that none of us, probably quite frankly, identify with. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. By the way, he's going now, he's moving now from talking in principle with abstract theological terms to talking about a person. Now he's, now he's dialing us into Christ. Because, friends, strictly, strictly speaking, faith does not justify us. It doesn't justify us at all. Faith itself is meaningless. And you can have faith in all sorts of things. There's no power in faith. But it is Christ who justifies us through faith. I know we read terms that we, know, we read, you know, say by faith. But we really, you got to recognize, you know, the, 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 the literary terms that are used here, the methods that are used here. The Bible uses it all the time. If I were to say, you know, we're saved by the cross, would that be an accurate statement? Because it really isn't, is it? The cross is a big piece of wood. I'm not saved by a big piece of wood. Even getting a little bit more closer to the issue, if I were to say I was saved by the blood of Christ, am I saved by the blood of Christ? I mean, if he cut his hand, and there was blood there? Was that blood saving? No. Just because when we take cross, what are we really talking about? We're talking about the crucifixion of Christ. And so, blood, what are we talking about? We're talking about the death of Christ. But even then, if I, am I saved by the death of Christ? Is it not the resurrection of Christ? Matter of fact, isn't, the, isn't it the life of Christ? And the death of Christ, and the resurrection, and the ascension of Christ. I mean, it, it always points to all the whole story, although we use those little phrases. So we're not saved by faith. Christ saves us through faith. The reason faith is effective is due to Christ, its object, having bore upon himself the curse we deserve. Our sin has been imputed, that is, credited to him, charged, if you will, to his account. I mean, think about that, this idea of a curse. Do you, do you think that you deserve a curse? I mean, we, we might kind of hypothetically go, yeah, I deserve a curse, whatever. I just had this go to lunch. I mean, do we get the depth of that? Herein made a monumentally significant distinction between biblical Christianity, my friends, and all other religions. The atheist has no God and therefore cannot give any authoritative account for any objective morality whatsoever. And I realize I just dismissed a bunch of best-selling books in one sentence, but it's simply true. Jews, and I'm not saying this disrespectfully, I'm just addressing the issue, and I hope this is how it can be disrespectful to people. But Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, etc., may have some sort of grasp of deity or some sort of grasp of, of eternity. But friends, if their God is a just God, how can he maintain his just character without condemning every single person who sins? 
We, we rail against human courts who wink at sin and launch criminals back in society, right? When we hear that, oh, you know, there are budget cuts. So let's think of things we can get rid of. Oh, I got a good idea. Let's just put all the prisoners free. What kind of thinking is that? I mean, I, I, you know, to get into a biblical idea of civics, you know, and the things the government should be doing, that's one of the things they should be doing is protecting the innocent people from criminals. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> but the point is, we, we rail against judges or courts or societies who, who, go, who, who launch criminals back into society. What about a God who does that? What about a God who says, you know, I know you're guilty, I know this, I know this, come on, it's no big deal. I'm just going to ignore it. In the Christian faith, friends, God doesn't wink at sin. He doesn't pretend that it didn't happen. God punishes sin. He's a just God. It's called justice. And He punishes sin. And how does He do that? It's accomplished by God the Son taking on Himself a human body and those sinless becoming sin. Though He always did that which was pleasing to the Father, He became a curse. The reference Paul uses here of hanging on a tree comes from Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. If a man has committed a sin deserving of death, is that you? Is that me? And he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall bury him that day, so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is the curse of God. You, that's what I'm saying. Do you identify with that person hanging on the tree? You're, a, you're, you're guilty before man, you're guilty before God, and you're so guilty you defile the land. Do you think of yourself that way? Because I don't know if I do. But that's the way, that's what Paul's using to define us apart from the grace of God and faith in Christ. He becomes a curse for us. He goes on the tree, if you will, and he takes the curse upon himself. He becomes the curse. The guilty man in this context in the Old Testament was usually stoned and put on the tree. He was publicly acknowledged as guilty before man and a curse before God. And what the Apostle Paul is explaining here is that in the sight of God, all men deserve this curse. But Jesus was hanged on a tree in our place. Our sin, our guilt, our pain, but more than that, the very condemnation and wrath of the Father was poured out on that one righteous man, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. That's the heart of the Christian faith. Talk about getting close to God. How can you leave that out? We had a substitute. We call it substitutionary atonement. We had a substitute take our place on that cross and in that death and in that curse. A substitute. And I, as I've become a parent, I've learned to appreciate this idea of taking upon yourself that which somebody you love has. You know, you know what I'm talking about? If you're a parent, you know the way that feels when your kids are sick. You know, I look at my kids and they're sick and I'm like, you know, and they're in pain. And I, to be honest with you, you walk in that room and you look at them and go, you know what? If I could take your pain and put it on me, I'd take it. You know, any, any, I don't know. I can't think of any parent who wouldn't go, yeah, for sure I would do that. Because you can't stand seeing your child in pain. A couple of weeks ago, I was visiting little Jack in the oncology department of the Miller Children Hospital, you know, and you walk in. It's the hardest place for me. I've been in millions, not millions, but probably thousands of visits in hospitals. And the child oncology department is the place that I'm just like, I don't know if I can make it. I'm not going to sure if I'm going to get through this. I'm going to share that with you. But, you know, one scene, I'm walking through, and I'm looking in this room, and I see, you know, this young child laying in bed, and the dad is like on the bed, like right up to this little boy or girl, I couldn't tell. And I look at that, and I'm like, "Wow, this is like overwhelming." But I could, I don't, and I don't know what he's thinking. But I, I kind of thought to myself, if that was me, it'd be like I'd want to be that close to go take what's in you and put it in me. Yeah, I'll take it. 
But the illustration I just used is a poor illustration, and let me tell you why. Because my kids are, um, well, in my opinion, cute, and uh, they love me, and um, they're attractive to me. But the Bible says that God did this for us when? While we were yet sinners. See, the illustration falls to, y'all, y'all kind of got what I was talking about, right? Okay, let's take that same thing and let's take it to the, um, uh, you know, what's it, what's it called? Where they're waiting to be executed, uh, death row. And you're walking through death row and you're looking at guys and you're going, you know what? I wouldn't give that guy my fingernail. These people disgust me. See, we don't get there emotionally, do we? That's a tougher one for us to get. But that happened for us while we were yet sinners. By the way, that's the way we're called to love others. You know? Not only that, the illustration falls short in the fact that I have nothing to trade. What you have here is Jesus becomes the curse, and then we become the righteousness. He, he takes our sin, and then He gives us His righteousness. It's a double imputation, a double trade. What am I going to do with my kids? Right? Think of that illustration again. You know, I'll, you know, I'll take your sickness, but it's got to be a trade. You get my age and baldness. See, Dad, I feel good now, but look at me. It doesn't work. But Jesus is, is righteous. And He gives us his, his righteousness. And He takes His only Christ to do this. Friends, that's the heart of the Christian faith. And somebody says, what is, what is Christianity in a nutshell? And I tell you what, we need to be careful that that message isn't lost or supplanted by subordinate doctrine. We have, there are other things, there are other doctrines in the Bible. Are they important? Eschatology and different views of, you know, how the family is to be governed and the different views of the way society is to be governed. Are those important? Yeah. And sometimes we cover them on Sunday morning, sometimes on Sunday night. But this, this is that. And I'm pointing to the Lord's Supper. This is the heart of the Christian faith. The, there is, quite frankly, a treasury of words which convey this glory to us. We read in Isaiah 53, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I know I quote that a lot, but that's a good passage. The Lord has laid on Jesus Christ the guilt and the sin of us all. Later in Isaiah 53, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul under death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, right? On the cross with the other sinners. And he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. You, got, you get the idea? You get the concept? I mean, is that clear? Because I think it's just amazing. I, I've shared this with people who are religious. Uh, a lot of my Roman Catholic friends, because, I, you know, and I, again, I don't mean to be uh, disrespectful, but that doctrine is a doctrine that doesn't, they would not believe what I... I mean, some Roman Catholics might say, I believe that, but the Roman Catholic doctrine does not agree with what I just taught. And when I talk to my Roman Catholic friends, quite frankly, oftentimes they're just overburdened with guilt because they realize, you know, I need to live up to a certain standard, you know, in order to get out of purgatory and get to come out of God. And you share this with them, it, talk about being an oasis for a parched soul. It's almost like that news is too good. It can't be true. In Hosea, we read of how Christ becomes death's worst nightmare. I love this verse here. I mean, it's just such a strong passage talking about the conquering of death in, in very kind of like personal terms of Hosea 13, 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. And then he starts talking to death. O death, I will be your plague. O grave, I will be your destruction Pity is hidden from my eyes. I have no pity on you, death. And I just had an image of that movie, Ghost, and the 
those dark things coming and grabbing the guy, and it's almost like, no, it's it's that dark thing that seems so powerful. It's the grace and power of God that destroy, destroys them. Has no pity upon the darkness. Has no pity upon the devil. No pity upon evil. That evil will be destroyed. Death will be destroyed. Our greatest enemy, the Bible says, will be destroyed by the cross of Christ. Finally, the last verse, Paul explains how this has always been the plan of God, going back to Abraham and even further. That the blessing of Abraham, verse 14, might come upon the Gentiles in Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Friends, Christ's effective bearing of the curse of God is the means by which that promise, that covenant promise given to Abraham, that all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, is extended to you, to me, to the whole world. This is all based not upon, not upon man's ability or man's talent, but on a covenant promise made by God. Covenant, that word, I know we use it a lot. It's the idea of kind of like a contract but it's more personal than that. You think of the contract, your marriage contract, right? You don't, you know, you, hopefully you don't say, well, you know, honey, we've made a contract. And you know, I'm here because of our contract. You know, like some cold business deal. It's a covenant. So it, is, it includes that contract, but it's more than that. It's God's making a, I've made you a promise, and I keep my promises. Of the bringing in of the Gentiles. You, see, you know, bringing in the whole world. The Apostle Paul quotes Isaiah in Romans 10 about this, and he says, I was found, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. What does that even mean? I was found by those who didn't seek me? I was, I was, I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me? It's almost like God becomes this intruder. Right? We didn't invite you. All of a sudden, he's sitting in your living room. And you're like, what are you? You know, it's, that's the picture kind of that you get here. I'm found by those who did not seek me. It's, it seems kind of paradoxical. But it's, I think Paul's way of saying, look, it, it's not a matter of you finding God. It's a matter of him finding you. You're seeking him because he sought you out first. You love him because he loved you first. You chose him because he chose you first. In the final analysis, we don't find God. He finds us. Full of the Spirit. You know, he says here, the promise of the Spirit through faith. It would be an interesting poll to, to take. You know, you know, if we were to poll everybody and say, what would you call, uh, how would you define the idea of a church full of the Spirit through faith? But what would that be? The promise of the Spirit through faith. What is it? A church that has the Spirit through faith. What do they look like? I guess what pops up into my head, because of my background, is a charismatic, right? Gifts of the Spirit, a lot of action, a lot of hullabaloo. Let me tell you, friends, churches that are full of the Spirit and faith are churches that know and embrace justification by faith alone. Perhaps in an experiential or existential way, there are things that we can do to foster and an increased appreciation of what God has done for us. We're going to do that in just a second here with the Lord's Supper. But what should never, ever be left out of the equation is the blessed news that our closeness to God happened when His Son came to us. You understand what he said? If that, if that message is missing from our faith, then we're building our houses on the weak and shifting sand. But if our faith for justification, for peace with God, is found in Christ alone, we are on the rock. And we have received the promise of the Spirit. Let us pray. Father God, we do pray for our church, and we pray for churches everywhere that, that we would, in fact, contend for the faith and not lose this message, the heart of the Christian faith, that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost and the price he paid with his own life. May that, Father, be our treasure. 
may, Father, we never stray from the centrality of that message, knowing that any other good thing that happens will flow from that message. And those who, by grace through faith, have been delivered from the curse of the law because Jesus 